life's tough, but superheroes are tougher. A podcast about real-life superheroes in the entertainment industry with your host, Stephen Shane. This episode is brought to you by the Podcast Services Division at Life's Tough Media. Having your own podcast allows you to creatively reach all types of audiences, from clients to prospects, to your most loyal membership base. And by utilizing studio affiliates located around the world, coupled with quality remote recording capabilities, Life's Tough Media makes having a corporate podcast easier than ever before. Contact us for a no-obligation consultation at info at lifestuff.com or visit lifestuff.com to learn more. Welcome back, everybody, to uh, Life's Tough Podcast uh, with Alex and Stephen. How are you doing today, Alex? Every day is a good day. And today, our special guest is Angelique Roche, who we know very, very well. Uh, she is uh, the voice and face of a lot of the Marvel stuff that you see online, but she's also the face and the voice of uh, Ace Comic Con. We've mm-hmm. used Angelique for, for many, many years, and people very closely associate her with Ace. So welcome, Angelique. It's great to have you here today. Oh, thank you. It's good to see both of your faces. Yes, I know. from across, across the country now. Well, well, Chris Evans, Chris Evans. Well, yeah, I saw you. I saw you for a second backstage at Chris Evans. So yes, yeah, that was that good. Was that, was fun. that was great. Um, that was fun. But yeah, and yes, I am now in LA, which is so good. Yeah, listen, it's Better warmer here though. Sure. <laughs> I don't know. It's, yeah. Right now, it's warmer here than it is there. This morning, I'm not gonna lie. I went for a run this morning, and it was not. It was not warm. Hmm. Right. That's what I'm telling you. You got to be a little careful. So, Angelique, uh, for the people out there that don't know you, and and this is why we like to do this broadcast, because we like to bring people behind the scenes a little bit. They see you on our broadcast. They see you on the Marvel broadcast. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you started at Marvel, and how you wound up at Ace? Oh, wow. So um, for folks who don't really know me, um, well, past any of the stuff that I do at host, I'm actually a, a licensed attorney. Uh, I started off in politics, uh, ended up in philanthropy, and got my first uh, official, like, paid gig during um, interview as, as working for SiriusXM. So I was working for SiriusXM uh, for a couple of years as a part-time host and doing their images and really was like, this is what I've always wanted to do. I started off in journalism in, in arts and entertainment, which is, you know, full circle for me, and did acting and voiceover and stuff when I was in college. And so... I got a, a call about doing a voice test uh, and talking about some stuff at Marvel as new media at Marvel was expanding out. And we had a couple meetings, a couple interviews, and we started the Marvel's Voices podcast in 2018. Uh, the Marvel's Voices podcast turned into red carpets, turned into con cons. Then, you know, I started working at Sci Fi Wire doing their podcast, Geek Explain. Uh, which for a lot of folks who don't know, uh, there were a bunch of podcasts that were done at Sci-Fi Wire back in the day with a joint thing with Amazon Alexa. And so whenever you say, Alexa, what's the news for the day? I was one of those podcasts <laughs> for a year where basically I did the cliff notes That's of cool. all the nerdy stuff you love, like Dune, uh, Black Lightning, um, I- anything you can think of, um, chaos. So um the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, like breaking down from, you know, if you've never seen a thing before, or you've never really like engaged with it before, you can listen to five to 10 minutes of that podcast and get a decent start. It's on iTunes now. Uh, I am sorry that everything is dated at this point. It was <laughs> it was a while back. Uh, the dates for Dune were different. Like, let's just be real. <laughs> yeah, um, the yeah. world changed since then. A right, right. little bit, a little bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, and that's just, that led to doing carpets. And it was really great for me because I was still doing production work. So I still do production work for nonprofits. Um, I still do consulting and messaging and stuff, which is like my my love and bread and butter but i was very lucky that i got to come back full circle from you know college when i was doing music reviews i was doing movie reviews when i was talking about arts and culture um uh, and it was just great right i was thinking the other day of one of my first album reviews was uh the nappy roots uh Mm. when they came out with their album on uh uh, and poor folks. And I was actually listening to the album yesterday. I was like, wow, life can be really full circle uh, in a very interesting way. Um, and I'm really lucky I get to do what I love. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting. With, um, and, and Alex has been with me for probably six or seven years now, Alex, right? That's a long time, yeah. right? Long time. And, and when, when we started Ace, 
you know, uh, we, we had, I had uh, eight people in, in, in our department at Wizard and seven of those eight came to work at Ace. Uh, the only one who has eluded us was uh, was Ari, but she went out and kind of did did her own thing, and she's she's been very successful on her own. And I remember when we started, we said I said to everybody, I said whatever we've done in the past, I don't care, doesn't matter. I said that we have to do something fresh, we have to do something different, we need to reintroduce the panels. I mean, and 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 the story that I tell all the time is, I said if, if you've seen one William Shatner panel, you've seen them all. No offense to William Shatner. But it's the same hosts, the same weekends, the same anecdotes, the same questions, the same everything. Yeah. And, 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 and our directive to our staff, not just with the panel programming, but with everything. And Alex knows with the vendors, we want yeah. to have curated vendors. I said, Alex, I don't want to have 25 Funko Pop vendors, have two Funko Pop. So we went through the entire, every little piece of the show. And, and the big, big directive was, how do we make the panel programming special and unique and different than what everyone else is doing? So talk a little bit about your experience there and then working at Ace and doing some of these comic cons. So I think it's really interesting. It's like for me, um, you know, people always ask this question, okay, so you're a lawyer and you have an LLM in international comparative law and you worked for a senator <laughs> and this is what you do for a living now. And I was like, oh no. It's far more connected than you think. Um, you know, one of the things about law school and studying print journalism is that it teaches you how to look at a thing. It teaches you how to tell a story um, and it teaches you how to ask questions and not just like the first question, but also like, oh, that's interesting. What about this or that? And follow, really follow the trail. And so for me, and I'll kind of like break down my interviews and why I love ACE interviews so much because you, any journalist has ever done a junket yeah. Or has ever done a panel knows that um, for folks out there who don't know how the sausage is made, journalists get three to five minutes. That's it. When you see a junket interview, you get tossed into a room. You got three to five minutes. If somebody talks long, somebody doesn't talk long, doesn't matter. You have three to five minutes and you're out. And it's really a craft, right? Um, folks who work in this space have honed for a very long time on craft was also a lot of times why you get very standard questions mm. because you're sometimes very scared to ask that question that's going to eat up those minutes and one of the things i love about the ace panels is that you know you're getting 30 to 45 minutes and what has been so fun for me over the last couple of years is you get to take the artist and the audience on a journey right and it's it's always this amazing understanding like for folks who've ever seen the panels and Steven, you know this, Alex, you know this, they're about 30 minutes cultivated questions based upon past, present, and future. I try my best to make sure if it's been answered 12 times, yeah. sometimes I'll throw it in, but I'll, I'll attach it to another question that's a little bit different, a little bit new that looks at whatever it is in a different perspective, or I will just trash it, right? Like, and find a way to infuse into something there, i.e. hello there. Like I wasn't gonna ask like, but I was gonna make sure like, hello there was gonna be said. Like it, to, it, it, had it, it, it had to, right? It's law, I think. You know the law well, so you knew I, that I, was law. Yeah. Right. And Chris, uh, and Chris, Jamal, is, and Chris Jamal Evans, Chris yeah, Jamal yeah. Evans too. Yeah, look, exactly. these, are, these are rules <laughs> yeah. that, Can't that break a host them. and moderator must them. follow. Um, and I think that actually brings to the second point, like, Someone very wise once told me when you are doing these interviews, you have the ability to open up and you have to remember that there is a third person in the conversation and the third person is the audience. And they're actually the most important person in the conversation because you are, are navigating the conversation that they may or may not ever have, right? And so the fan questions and having the ability to ask those fan questions and cultivate those fan questions and in particular, for the, for those who like don't haven't figured it out yet, like I'll always go through it. I'll be like, all right, so I've answered that question already in my questions. So I hope that fan's happy. But ooh, this question, all right, we're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna put that in there. And I always have more than less just in case an actor uh, or a performer already answers the question. So if you had a question that you were like, I really wish he asked my question and Chris already answered it, I'm, I'm going to skip, right? I try not to make it redundant and I try to make it 
a full conversation that also makes the person very comfortable. And that's the other great thing when you have those 30 minutes, 45 minutes is like, they get a chance to also be like humans that are talking about the thing they love the most, which is performing. Um, and that's, and that's just, that's really incredible to me. And so the, the great thing that I love about ACE is like, one, like the fans are central, right? Like that's the whole point of having the conversation at the end of the day is like, it's, it's the fans that make this great. Yeah. Um, and so it's, so it's really interesting. So I've had a chance to really marry together, um, in a very strange way, law school, studying journalism, you know, my work in philanthropy and messaging and production, and just really thinking about how the conversation flows from beginning to end. Like my questions are even in a particular order. Like I'll go on a tangent here and there if I think something is like really, really great, i.e. Chris Evans rollerblading or, <laughs> you know, Evan pulling out a Winnie the Pooh or, yeah. you know, Tom Ellis deciding to sing on stage. Like, yeah, we're going to do it. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to stop that from happening. These are the moments that make these conversations great. But, you know, I do walk in, like, having an understanding of what the pacing is going to be, like, having an understanding, much like somebody puts together a comic book. Like, if you talk to, like, a Greg Pak or a Vida Ayala um, or a Jimmy P, like, if you talk to these, like, they understand how many words go on a page. They understand how many panels are going to be on the page. They understand you know, when they've got to stop and they've got to move on to the next page or when they've got to stop and they've got to serialize this for the next issue. It's really, it's very, very similar to that kind of pacing. It's just, you know, a lot more variables that you can yeah, well, 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 like I'll dogs. say this. <laughs> like dogs. Yeah, yeah, like dogs. petting dogs. Yeah, you never know well, what can I, happen. All right, so so that kind of takes you on, on, our, on our journey through ACE. And then, and then now what we like to do... Uh, for the show is, you know, the show is very superhero focused. Is It's kind of what Alex and I focus on. It's kind of what we talk about. You know, when you read the news every day, you see the news, you watch the news, there's so many things going on. And, and just, can you talk about like, obviously throughout your career, you've probably had mentors or people that you've mentored or things like that. Do you have a superhero moment that you've had in your own career? Oh man. Ooh, um. So it's interesting. There are a couple of moments, right? And and it's funny because as we're taping this, it is it is Prince's uh, the memorial for Prince's uh, departure from the world. Um, and for me, when I was a kid, like there are three superheroes uh, besides all the other influences, right? Like I I lost my mind when I met Nikki Giovanni, Maya Angelou. Like these were like key for me as a young writer, um, but. Three of my main superheroes, my mom, who is just a baddie, like <laughs> she, you know, she did live events. Um, she dragged me from pillar to post with her. Like I, my people always ask me this question, like, why, like you interview all of these people who are like so great. And I'm like, yeah, they're people like, okay. and it's probably because like, I met too short when I was nine years old. Like I saw TLC perform on their very first tour. Like. Um, you know, I met Aaron, I've met Aaron Neville several times. Like it, my mother was very versed in a lot of concerts and a lot of performances. Like I saw Master P play when his first album came wow. out, like stuff, stuff I was way too young to see. Right. Yeah. Um, right. So I just want to be clear, was not, was not in college when this happened. My mother just taught it from yeah. her work at once. Um, the second hero for me was my, my grandfather on my mother's side who, um, he grew up on a plantation. My uh, older aunts and uncles grew up on a plantation uh, that had that turned over to sharecropping and he became a carpenter. And because he became a carpenter, he was able to make a lot of cash because you could not get loans as a black person at that time. In fact, they would not give him a loan for his house. He worked and worked and worked until he could pay for it in cash and then built it himself. Wow. And then built a company to hire more people of color in his hometown eventually became the first sheriff's deputy in Port Allen. And he has a wow. park named after him because when integration happened, they were going to close down the pool on the side, on the side of the highway where all of the black kids stayed. And it was going to make kids have to travel across LA one to, if anybody's from Louisiana, they get, that's where all of the 18 wheelers are and kids were getting hit trying to just go to the pool during the summer Crazy. because they're small and 18 wheelers are big. 
And so, you know, we always grew up with his legacy because he was a quiet man and he would always say this thing. He's like, you have six months out of the year to take care of your own business and six months out of the year to stay out of everybody else's. <laughs> I like it. That's good. I like it. That's good. That's, That's a good one, Alex. Yeah, yeah, I have yeah. not heard that one before. It's, and, and he was just, and he was just such an, an amazing man. And then, you know, I do have a lot of other heroes, like honestly, a lot of artist heroes. But for me, like I grew up really idolizing Prince. And more than him just like being unusual or different or fun or like talking about all the things that no one else is talking about at the time. Mm -hmm. um, he was a little bit of a weirdo and he was way successful, right? Mm -hmm. And he was talking about things that were interesting to me. But one of the things that people don't really know is that Prince had this huge work ethic. Prince was like, yo, if I'm not going to be a professional basketball player, and if anybody knows how short Prince was, <laughs> not, not going to happen. He right. took music business in high school every single year they would allow him to take it the same class over and over and over again he knew he was the type of guy that would tell his band it's like i don't care if you're going to the grocery store you walk out of the hotel room like you are a rock star because we are rock stars right and he was never perfect like i mean when he first played i believe it was the hollywood bowl and i think it was mick jagger i just i, mean, I want to make sure I, I i just folks can correct me if i'm wrong they like threw bottles and cans at him and he got on a plane and went all the way back to Minneapolis. They had to go get him. Wow. So he also wasn't perfect. Right. And so for me, like growing up and I always tell people, you know, being a, a woman of a certain age during direct market, I didn't have access to comic books like I do now. Like I became, I was a huge movie fan. And then I realized all the movies I love came from comics. And then I became a comic book fan, but I owned a Prince comic. I owned a Star Trek comic. I owned the death of Superman because that was a gift from my father. But I will say I collected music like folks collected trade. Like that was just, I still do. Um, and so those are really hero moments. And so this is all leading to uh, a friend of mine in law school, uh, first year law school, um, gave me backstage passes to see Prince perform. Wow at Essence when he first took the first time he took over Essence. And it was a superhero moment for me because what people don't know about that night, Prince's, the agreement was that Prince would choose the entire lineup that night. What Prince don't, what Prince didn't tell them is that Prince performed in every band that played that night in costume. Wow. There was literally wow. one moment that man came out on roller skates with an Afro wig on and me and my best friend looked at each other and we went, I know that guitar riff. <laughs> that's Something, funny. Is that? I think that's... No. <laughs> no way and so for me, like, there were a number of superheroes that night, right? Like, there was so a superhero that. that gave me the ticket, there was a superhero like, literally seeing this this actual live man like hop on a speaker Easy. and do a split and then get back up and then continue performing. Prince was a superhero. Like, yeah. I don't know, like I just, he just was a superhero for so many of us, particularly, you know, folks of color who were nerdy, right? Who did delve into things like that, who were about perfection, who didn't kind of, you know, wanted to wear bright colors and do these things. So that was really big for me. And my mom was crazy supportive um, to a point where I have more memorabilia than I probably should have. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think I think for me there, and this, there's, there's been so many other superhero moments, right? Like I've, I've worked for the Senate, you know, I, I've, I've worked, I worked for the presidential election campaign for Barack Obama and the inauguration. So, I mean, I'm sure there are many, but like, like really foundational for me was seeing in real life, someone who could blaze their own path and really do what they loved for a living. If you just worked hard enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, when we started ACE, it was something that, that Alex and I had discussed, and obviously the rest of the, st the staff discussed. What, make it, what made ACE unique from the very beginning, and we said this to everybody, is, you know, it's one thing to go somewhere and meet your heroes, but at ACE, you meet your superheroes, okay? And that was always the mantra that we have is, 
you don't go to Ace to meet your heroes. You're going to see your superheroes, right? Yeah. And when you're meeting Henry Cavill, you're meeting Superman. You're not meeting, you know, you go to Disney World, you meet, you meet somebody who's Mickey Mouse and you're a little kid and you're meeting somebody who's in a Mickey Mouse costume, right? Yeah. Uh, but, they, but the child doesn't know that it's a, a person in a Mickey Mouse costume. Think about being yeah. a young child and being able to go to an A show and, and meeting Gal Gadot. Yeah. You're, you're meeting Wonder Woman. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, a hundred percent. Absolutely. And like, you know, that was like the same feeling for me. Like I, I remember this is going to age me a little bit. Like I remember when TLC came, right? Like I left, I like literally want a joke and thank you Funko for sending me this. <laughs> left eye sits nice. on my desk. Nice. Right. Um, because for me, again, like she blazed her own path. She was on her own thing. And so I remember sitting there in awe. Like I was just, I was just, I was just like, try <laughs> left eye. And like, you know, cause you, cause you, you, in your head, they're bigger than life. And so for me, when you meet folks like Nichelle Nichols, or you see folks out there, um, who were just so key and so core, like interviewing Tiana Paris, who was going to end up being Monica Rambeau, who is like my like my favorite superhero because she is from New Orleans. She is, so, and she led the Avengers in the comics. Like, I don't know, man. I've had so many opportunities. I mean, I was the same. I honestly say I'm such a an an a inter like fandom nerd that was the same way i was when i met matt thanks to ace uh who by the way uh was very complimentary i have a doctor who tattoo which nobody knows uh so i did not know fandom. That. yeah <laughs> yeah so so as like i it's my only nerdy tattoo uh besides my valkyrie on my arm uh but it is a custom of a bow tie spinning around and it says hello sweetie in gallifran and you know having that moment to like meet matt smith and like having that moment like i've interviewed three doctor who's like yeah. that's just that's it's bonkers to me right and two of them were for eight and it's just you know it is it is those moments i think i think you're absolutely right where you just kind of sit there and you're like and for me they're extra heroes because i know in in my head the thing that makes them heroic to me is that they really love what they do yeah and they really Genuine. love being storytellers um, and they're good folks and they're just, yeah. And they're just brilliant at their craft. Like hearing yeah. Tom Hiddleston talk about his craft. Uh, Tom, Tom's a different, yeah. Tom, Tom is, uh, yeah. Tom is an actor. Tom is the best. Totally. Tom, Tom is in a class of his own. By the way, the place to be at the show is at the photo ops exit about right. five seconds after people <laughs> exit because they're crying, they're collapsing. Tom yep. Holland photo op, the number one place to ever be all time. Tom Holland photo op exit about three <laughs> seconds, about three seconds after I they passed out it. one time after a photo and he won't let me won't let me hear the end of it. Won't let me hear the uh, end of it. Tom look. Tom Holland, Tom Holland photo ops. That's the place to be. Look. Watch watch the young girls walking out. They are just they're crying, they're collapsing. It's the craziest thing you've ever seen. And Tom is just again, him so it is so funny, you know. I love when people go, so are they as nice as I think they are? And you're like, yeah. Yeah. They, they really are. are. Yeah. Just as yeah. nice as you think they are. Um, if not more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 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 you touched so you touched on Prince a little bit, who obviously influenced the culture a lot at the time. He influenced arts, entertainment, film, music, music. definitely. And and one thing that that we talk about here all the time is does the culture influence the art? Does the art influence the culture? Is it sort of symbiotic? Does it work together? You're about to see Shang-Chi on the screen. You saw Black Panther do over $1.4 billion at the box office. You've seen Captain Marvel. You've seen Wonder Woman. Think about Wonder Woman at the time that she came out where she just became this global phenomenon. Talk a little bit from your experience about how the culture is affecting the films and television and vice versa. And obviously Shang-Chi is on the way. Well, and I think it's interesting because it's not, and, 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 and I, I love, so I take a disposition of genre and even bigger, right? Like, like a Takashi Kovach to me is a superhero. 
he's not like he's like a little bit of an anti-hero um i don't know if any of y'all watch altered altered carbon um but like you know or or the crew from the magicians right Mm -hmm. are all heroes right at the end of the day they're saving magic in a speculative fiction where magic exists Sure. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it's so interesting to me because this is this is a debate that continues to happen, right? There are books that are written on this. There's the physics of being a superhero. There's a the science of being a superhero. There is this like we had a, this dope conversation with a costume designer from SNL about what does it mean to put together a, a functional superhero costume? Like people think about these things, and you know. It's not a novel concept to talk about, obviously, Star Trek and Back to the Future and, you know, all of these ideas of hoverboards, um, all these concepts of a tricorder, eh, it's really your iPhone, let's be yeah. real. Um, or even like thinking back to stuff like Hidden Figures, right, which is a real story, but also at the time, it was also like, you think about a computer, what's in our hand? used to be in the size of two rooms that were bigger than most New York apartments. Yeah. Like, um, and so, you know, one of the things that I love about science fiction and superheroes is one, they are modern day mythology, right? Like they, you know, the things that we love about our heroes is that they're not perfect. They would be boring if they were perfect. If Superman never got married and had kids, no offense, I would not be like, <laughs> Okay, so this dude, he's just, you can't kill him. He doesn't fight. He just saves everything. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah. That's, that's interesting, I guess. Yeah. But then you're like, but Superman can die. And they're like, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> One green okay. rock, ruin his day. One green rock. <laughs> bring in some doom, bring in a green rock. Um, <laughs> give him a black suit. Um, you know, or Harley Quinn, right? So, you know, people love a good anti-hero. Like, I'm so excited for the new Suicide Squad because they're heroes, but are they? Right. They're being heroes because they're forced to be because they're bad guys. And at the end of the day, Harley Quinn doesn't really want to hurt anybody. She just wants a highway named after her. That's it. (laughs) Uh, That's it. That's all she wants. Um, At least in the animated series. Yeah. Uh, So... So I think it's so I think it's really interesting and I, and I love it because folks are able to work through problems or see themselves or articulate who they are into more depth when they see these characters really fleshed out on screen, right? Um, I love it every time someone recognizes my tattoo on my my arm, and I remember I remember the day I was I had just come back from overseas. I was in it was my birthday in the movie theater I was watching Thor Ragnarok I was like I'm gonna do this in the middle of the day this sounds great and I saw Tessa Thompson come out and there was a tattoo on her arm and I was like I must have that tattoo <laughs> I've never done that in my life y'all never like I have many tattoos but it's never been like I want that one gonna make it happen for some reason that embodies everything that I believe in um being fierce being imperfect being a warrior like being persistent overcoming all of these things right and you know i love when a fan goes oh my god you have a valkyrie tattoo <laughs> and i'm like yes yes i do that's so cool and I'm like, <laughs> thanks uh because there is this moment where you bond over this hero that embodies who you are or the embodies who you want to be, right? So I think there's a synergy moment there. And I think there's also a synergy moment that's happening where the face of superheroes are changing, right? And not just gender, not just race, not just geography, but their ability to be authentic and genuine based upon the cultures in which they are rooted. And that's really dope. And I'm not saying that by any means, anything is perfect. Um, Storytelling is not perfect. Um, if storytelling was perfect, we'd have less shows on TV and everybody would watch the same thing. Yeah. Like that's, that's just the honest to God truth, right? Like, um, that's why some people really love Babylon five and some people are like deep Smith nine. Yeah. Everybody yeah. will understand that joke. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but everyone loves Patrick Stewart as John Luke Picard. I don't think there's uh, any, you can't argue. That's, that's <laughs> not even an argument. 
Come it's on. just a fact. Again, we're talking facts and laws. There's nothing, there's nothing <laughs> that, is, that is a constant. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, in my perfect world, um, James McAvoy and Sir Patrick Stewart are the only right. two people I can imagine oh, yeah. playing. I know, right? I know. Like, it's great. And it's because they embody the characters, right? And right. I think that also gets in the whole concept of glass and unbreakable and all of these mm -hmm. other kind of really dope things out there. But I think we are at a synergy moment because I remember that when I first left uh, my nine to five job as a vice president of a philanthropy, and I say that to stay, my friends were like, so this nerd thing you're doing. <laughs> and I'm like, what? You mean this thing that's attached to a multi-billion dollar <laughs> industry? What? Yeah. You mean, do you remember Grecian gods? It's right. like, no? Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> here we are. And I think, I think we are coming into this space where you know, Amelia Clark, like, you know, everybody is like, yeah, I, I, I want in. I, I, I love this stuff. And it's more and more okay to be a nerd. Mm -hmm. Or at least it's more and more okay to love the genre that has been specifically denoted as, oh, that's nerdy. That's for kids. Oh. Why, why are you still doing that? You're an adult. Yeah. <laughs> Alex oh, still gets that. Alex, hey, hey, you, you, you still get that. I always get that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you know what? So, you should tell them. Comic books have their own section in the American Writing Museum in Chicago. Yeah, that's true. I tell them that's to call true. Carrie Cranston and talk about how comic books are an American, in, well, American yeah. combat books are an American. In right, right. That's another conversation. So, so, so Angelique, <laughs> you, you've worked with a lot of superheroes. You've worked with a lot of supervillains. Um, you know, you've done a lot of <laughs> you, you've done a lot of interviews. Is there a particular moment that you remember fondly, whether it was uh, Chris Evans petting the dog or anything like that, or? Is there is there any sort of moment in your mind that you're like, wow, this this person next sitting next to me really is a superhero, not just on the screen? Oh man, so me not win. Mm. Who is a ju I just uh, who just I don't care if you're a Chung Lee fan, I don't care if you're a Mulan fan, I don't care if you're an Agent May fan, mm -hmm. like. Ming Na Wen. It's C2E2. It's got to be two years ago. I mean, literally, it does have to be two years ago at this point. Um, <laughs> and That's right. Everything Ming is two Wen, years ago. Right. Ming Na Wen and Clark Gregg are on this little golf court on their way for me to interview them at C2E2 for Sci-Fi Wire. And I had met Ming Na before. In passing. But I am no one. I am just an interviewer. I'm here. She's met lots of people. Ming-Na shows up. And I don't know if you've ever seen um, Batteries Not Included, but Ming-Na was like, how is that? Like, she's just chill. She is zen. And I was like, oh, man. Oh, man, this is going to be hard. She's tired. Oh, God. Oh, no. Because any host out there is like, the worst thing in the world can happen is somebody pops up on your stage and low energy. In the matter of two minutes, Mingna powers back up and just becomes Mingna. And she goes, oh my God, it's so nice to see you. And every single time from that moment that I interviewed her for the first time on the red carpet, she has remembered me. Just hey. like she remembers everyone she has ever met. <laughs> Same thing with Clark Ray, right? So they get on stage and um, uh, what is it, Felinda? Felinda gets on stage, and this is this is about when everybody's like, we finally got Felinda. <laughs> yeah, about time, Felinda. And it was the it was the first time someone hopped off stage on me. And we're sitting up there, and they realize that they can't answer any questions because if anybody, again, if you're a host and you realize that people are on NDAs, there are just certain things. Yeah. And every single question I wanted, they were in the middle of season. So it was just like, everybody's like, yeah, you're just going to have to watch the show. And yeah, you're just going to have to watch the show. And then Clark Gregg does what no one else has ever done for me before in my position. He gets off stage, goes into the crowd, and basically takes over the panel. Now, in some people's mind, they're like, oh, Clark's doing a No, Clark was like, there's nothing she can ask us. We are here for the fans. I'm about to do this girl solid. <laughs> and he, he jumps off stage, goes in crowd, and starts talk, like putting the mic 
in front of like Phil Donahue, like Phil Donahue, like but like and just making their day. And in part of me, like it, and 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 no slight to any host, there's a part that could have gone, holy shit, I've lost control. Excuse my language, but I've lost control <laughs> of this panel. Mm-hmm. And in my head, I go, you know what? This is the greatest panel ever. Clark Gregg, right. I'm sitting up here with Agent May. Hanging out. The fans, the fans are happy. That's it. The bosses are happy. We got great content. And this is all about having fun, right? Because, you know, and I think it was it was just one of those moments where it is was just so memorable because we went backstage, we joked around, we took pictures, we chilled out, like and they were just so wonderful because they knew and if anybody knows the story of agents of shield it's the fans yeah like agent colson exists still in the mcu because fans said no we want H- similar to loki mm-hmm. no 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 we love this character right they can't get enough food. Yeah. By, right. by the way um, one what what no. one thing that i one thing that i did want to mention is uh Angelique has a knack for trending on Twitter after these interviews. <laughs> and that and that's that, let me tell you that's not every An single easy time thing. every single time she's done an event with us uh whether it's Chris Abbott with it, it always starts trending. There's something that all of a sudden my news feed blows up uh You're Chris a pro. Jamal You're Evans a pro. the tattoo Chris Jamal Evans the tattoos it's always something the little the the Winnie the Pooh it's yeah. You you have a knack for that capturing moment. for capturing it and being able to take advantage of it. And let me tell you something. I, I watch other panels now from other shows, and I do watch them all the time. I do watch them on, on, on Facebook and stuff. They just don't measure up. And I'm glad we sort of went down that road with you when we did. And and yeah. you've sort of people so closely associate with you with, with our panels now. Yeah. Like you're mm-hmm. sort of our face, which is great. Um, so let's wrap it up with this. Um, you've sort of taken us on your journey from where you started to where you are now. And obviously a lot of things have changed, right? The original, you used to have the original X-Men films and you had the original Blade films. Now you have these, you have Shang-Chi, the, the previews look unbelievably remarkable on them. Talk, us, talk to us a little bit about your journey compared with the journey of the films and television shows that we've seen since you started. You know, I am so excited for anyone under the age of 20 who this is their first first exposure to the superhero genre right yeah um because you do still get like the old school pow bam zoom you know knock down drag out clone sagas all of the (laughs) cool stuff right um but there's so much more access right so like we all grew up at least in my certain circles watching the x-men Mm-hmm. animated series the spider-man animated series a lot of us g- grew up watching sailor moon and sonic the hedgehog the good the good one and the bad one y'all i don't right. know why there was two of them i'm <laughs> sorry i don't i don't know um but now you've got kids that are growing up and their first time meeting spider-man is into the spider Verse. yeah or their first time meeting aquaman is jason momoa um which let's be real aquaman on super friends not jason Uh, no (laughs) Uh, almost complete opposites i would i would say almost complete opposites yeah yeah Mm -hmm. uh or like and so i think it's just it's so amazing because and i'm saying this to a friend the other day the people who grew up loving the comics of the 60s 70s and 80s right and even the 90s right in the early 2000s um they're now getting an opportunity to be at the helm of some of the dopest titles right now. Um, and when you think about the expansion of the Dakota verse, um, milestone, I still call it the Dakota verse. <laughs> um, when you think about, you know, NK Jemison writing Green Lantern, when you think about all of the Kickstarters, right? When you think about things like Submerge from Vita Ayala, when you think about this dope book that I love so much, uh, Chris Sabila um, wrote, writes it called Crowded. When mm-hmm. you think about how many pieces are out there that are relatable to how technology has changed and society has changed and identity has changed. Um, you know, it's it's gone from, you know, 
one storyline to a billion. And so you can find yourself and not just how you look or where you're from, but like stuff that you can relate to in anywhere, right? Like I love vampires, right? I love vampires and zombies. So for me, you know, the wild is such a cool, like it's yeah. such a cool comic book, right? Because it's a twist on it, right? Or I get to watch something like The Girl with All the Gifts, which is based on a prose novel by another uh, writer who does comic books. Like, it is just so many different ways that we can see it now that's been influenced by what we grew up reading, for better or for worse, right? Like, yeah. Lovecraft Country is a great example. Yeah. Love, love, Lovecraftian has uh, not uh, always been a great word. Yeah. Um, <laughs> He's not necessarily uh, been great on racial issues, <laughs> but Lovecraft Country is this, uh, like, yo, if you've not watched Lovecraft Country, just watch what they call the Indiana Jones episode, and you will just see where we are able to go and how big our imaginations can be, right? You know, this idea that we can all go to space or this idea that you know, one day we'll colonize, which I don't, not the greatest word in the world, but it's used a lot in sci-fi, um, in space and create colonies on the moon, right? And and hopefully do, we do it in a in a respectful way, because you know, ruining one planet can't ruin the moon. <laughs> I'm just we saying, love the moon. We look, love the moon. every single duck from Ducktales will be upset with you. If you ruin the moon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so I so I say that to say like. I don't want anybody to think that I don't, obviously I still watch DuckTales. Like yeah. I don't, I have not stopped watching the content that is now new to my nieces and nephews. And I'm very blessed. I have seven nieces and nephews. Wow. So Amen. they, Amen. they, they also think I'm the coolest thing ever. God bless sure. them. Right. Um, They're right. They're not wrong. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, but they keep me on my game, right? Like I gotta, I gotta still play video games. I got a Twitch channel. Like I do it cause I love it, but also I do it because that content is being infused with so much rich authentic authenticity and genuineness and innovation mm -hmm. and ingenuity, right? Like when you've spent your whole lifetime dreaming of the stuff that of, of the stuff that is our foundation, and then going, Oh, but wouldn't it be cool if he did this? And then you get to do it for a living? Yeah. Oh, man, come on. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining us today, Angelique. This was wonderful. We had a great time with you. It was great Fantastic. having you. And uh, we will see everybody next week on Life's Tough. Superheroes are tougher. See you later, guys. Bye, get some, get, you have to get some posters now, Stephen. This yeah, is, we got to get you some posters. Got to get some posters.